Coming up on Arirang News, South Korean President Moon Jae-in speaking at the UN announces to the world ambitious plans for the demilitarized zone to make it a symbol of peace and a center of peace-related cooperation. Business leaders from South Korea and Japan meet in Seoul to look for new opportunities together, a move toward resolving the two countries' ongoing trade conflict. And three more suspected cases of African swine fever are detected in South Korea. The authorities are moving quickly to contain the disease and stop it from hurting pork supplies. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in to our afternoon newscast. I'm Devin Whiting. In his keynote speech to the UN, President Moon Jae-in told the world about his ambitious goal of turning the heavily fortified demilitarized zone into an international peace zone. He also said his roadmap for the future of inter-Korean relations could open up a new era of lasting peace on the peninsula. Our Shin Se-min reports from New York. Turning the thin strip of land, a place that is dotted with some 380,000 landmines into an area of peace and reconciliation with the help of the international community. President Moon Jae-in standing before the delegations gathered at the UN General Assembly on Tuesday proposed remodeling the demilitarized zone into an international peace zone. The South Korean leader even hinted at designating the DMZ as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Such proposals are an extension to the promise already made by President Moon and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un during their summit in April last year. Stressing it'll take South Korean troops alone 15 years to remove anti-personal mines from the DMZ, President Moon called for international support and for other countries to be more accommodating to the North if it takes steps worthy of reward. President Boon also revisited the three essential principles that he sees as the keys to lasting peace. One, zero tolerance for war. Two, a mutual security guarantee. And three, co-prosperity. And he stressed that his administration is in favor of offering Pyongyang the security guarantees it so desperately seeks. 서로의 안전이 보장될 때 한반도 비핵화와 평화 체제를 빠르게 구축할 수 있습니다. By bringing in the international community into Korean peace process action plan, the president is hoping to assure North Korea of its security guarantees and perhaps give a much-needed boost to the Korea's denuclearization drive. Shin Se-min, Arirang News, New York. Also in his speech, President Moon talked about free trade and the need for countries to reflect on their past. He didn't mention Japan by name, but these were clearly references to Tokyo's trade restrictions on Korea and the Japanese government's unwillingness to take responsibility for its wrongdoings. Park Hee-jun has more. On the world's biggest diplomatic stage, President Moon Jae-in did not miss the opportunity to criticize Japan for refusing to compensate South Koreans, pushed into forced labor during Japan's colonial rule of Korea, and for Tokyo's recent retaliatory trade measures. It was an indirect but clear message to Japan. President Moon emphasized the importance of maintaining a free trade order, something Japan has been failing to do. Dongasia는 2차 세계 대전이 끝난 후 침략과 식민 지배의 아픔을 딛고 상호 긴밀히 교류하며 경제적인 분업과 협업을 통해 세계 사회에 유리 없는 발전을 이루어왔습니다. 자유 무역의 공정한 경쟁 질서가 the General Assembly speech was the first multilateral stage for President Moon since the Japanese government initiated its export curbs on South Korea's high-tech materials in July 
and since it took Seoul off its whitelist of trusted trading partners in August. However, President Moon has seemed to have refrained from stronger remarks that could have irritated Japan. But he shed light on how this whole Tokyo trade dispute is not simply a bilateral issue, but one that hurts the global trade order. According to the South Korean president, Seoul considers its neighbors as partners. And based on the regional partnership, South Korea strives to expand a people-centered community of mutual prosperity throughout the Korean Peninsula, East Asia, and ultimately to the whole of Asia. Through this message, a conciliatory gesture to Japan, President Moon once again called on Tokyo to work with Seoul to resolve their differences in a diplomatic manner. Park Hee-jun, Irang News. Also at the U.N. General Assembly, U.S. President Donald Trump in his speech discussed North Korea, saying again that it has so much unrealized potential. Another issue he brought up was his demand that U.S. allies like South Korea pay more for their defense. Kim Yo-sun reports. In his third speech to the United Nations as leader of the free world, President Trump said wise world leaders put their own people and countries first. Addressing the General Assembly on Tuesday, Trump delivered a speech focused on sovereignty, but he spoke briefly about North Korea. He called on the regime to denuclearize if it wished to reach its tremendous economic potential. And we have pursued bold diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula. I have told Kim Jong-un what I truly believe, that like Iran, his country is full of tremendous untapped potential, but that to realize that promise, North Korea must denuclearize. Amid high expectations for the resumption of working-level talks between Pyongyang and Washington, President Trump added the North will enjoy a brighter future once it abandons its nuclear weapons. However, the U.S. leader did not provide details on what he suggested last week to be a new method that could provide a breakthrough in the stalled talks. President Trump also urged Washington's allies to pay their fair share for the cost of their defense. We are also revitalizing our alliances by making it very clear that all of our partners are expected to pay their fair share of the tremendous defense burden which the United States has borne in the past. His remark comes as South Korea and the U.S. launched fresh negotiations in Seoul to renew their defense cost-sharing deal. He also said his administration will continue to pressure the Iranian regime, highlighting that the highest level of sanctions have been imposed against Iran following its recent attacks on Saudi Arabian oil facilities. On trade, President Trump lashed out at China for not embracing the reforms it promised to make when it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. He also demanded Beijing honor Hong Kong's freedom, legal system and its democratic way of life. Kim Hyo-san, Adida News. And staying in New York, the national security advisors of South Korea and the U.S., Chung yi Yong and Robert O'Brien, discussed ways to follow up on Monday's summit meeting between their presidents. It was the first meeting since O'Brien was appointed to the post last week, and they agreed to meet again soon in Seoul or Washington. O'Brien replaced former national security advisor John Bolton, whom Trump had fired because of differences he had with Bolton in many areas, including how to denuclearize North Korea. President Moon has reiterated South Korea's determination to form a joint team with North Korea for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and to co-host the Summer Games in 2032. In a meeting with International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach in New York, President Moon shared his administration's efforts to further the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Bach praised Moon's efforts to expand peace through the Olympics, starting with the 2018 Winter Games in Pyeongchang. Bach said he hopes those efforts will also lead to the success of the Tokyo Olympics and the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics, and that cooperation between Korea, China and Japan can help establish peace and prosperity in Northeast Asia. Three more suspected cases of African swine fever were reported in South Korea today. The new ones are in northern Gyeonggi-do province and Incheon. African swine fever is harmless to humans, but it threatens pork supplies because it's fatal to pigs. The Agriculture Ministry announced the first new case this morning. Take a listen. At 8.05 on Wednesday morning, a suspected case of African swine fever was reported at a pig farm in Gangwa County, Incheon. 
The suspected farm is 6.6 kilometers away from the farm in Gimpo, where the third case of the fever was confirmed. The other two new cases were reported in Yuncheon, Gyeonggi-do province, and Kangwa County in Incheon. The Agriculture Ministry said it plans to inspect pig farms and livestock-related facilities in 154 cities and counties as it prepares to sterilize them. The ministry on Tuesday issued a 48-hour nationwide standstill for all pig farms and factories and slaughterhouses. Under restriction now are the entire province of Gyeonggi-do, the city of Incheon, and Gangwon-do province. U.S. Democrats have launched a formal impeachment inquiry into President Trump, making him the fourth American president to face impeachment proceedings. The impetus for the inquiry came just a few days ago when an anonymous source accused Trump of pressuring the leader of Ukraine to give him dirt on presidential candidate Joe Biden. Kim Dami has the details. The House will officially start an impeachment inquiry into President Trump. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi declared a dramatic move on Tuesday local time, claiming the U.S. leader had violated a U.S. constitutional order and that nobody is above the law. The actions of the Trump presidency revealed the dishonorable fact of the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. President Trump was quick to respond on Twitter but didn't take the decision well. Calling the announcement a total witch hunt, he insisted Democrats haven't even seen the transcript of the phone call that the inquiry is based on. He had earlier revealed that he had authorized the release on Wednesday of the complete, fully declassified and unredacted transcript with Ukraine's president. His decision comes after reports emerged that an anonymous whistleblower claimed Trump repeatedly pressured the new leader of Ukraine to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter at a time when Ukraine was desperate for military aid from the U.S. Now, each of the six committees, Judiciary, Intelligence, Ways and Means, Financial Services, Oversight and Foreign Affairs, will begin their investigations, dissecting different elements of Trump's presidency and his past and businesses. The House Judiciary Committee will then consider the Articles of Impeachment Resolution and schedule a vote on it. Only three American leaders before Trump have faced impeachment proceedings, and Congress has never booted one from the White House. Kim Dami, Arirang News. The trade war between South Korea and Japan continues, but they're looking for a resolution. This week, more than 300 business leaders and experts from the two countries are meeting in Seoul to discuss business exchanges and cooperation. Our Om Ji-young has more. The 51st Korea-Japan Business Conference kicked off its two-day annual event on Tuesday. Despite frosty diplomatic ties between the two countries over Tokyo's export curbs on Seoul, efforts are still being made to improve their relations on the business front. More than 300 guests from both countries, including government officials, business leaders and economic experts, gathered in central Seoul under the theme of Korea-Japan cooperation in a fast-changing global economy. On Tuesday, the first day of the two-day event, Korea Trade Minister Yoo Myung-hee and Japanese Ambassador to South Korea Yasumasa Nagamine delivered a congratulatory speech as special guests. This year's meeting was originally scheduled to take place in May, but was delayed amid souring bilateral relations due to a trade dispute sparked by Tokyo's expert curves on Seoul. One of the participants said that although the event was postponed, he was glad that it was held this year. Many firms in Korea and Japan have an important role in forming supply chains in the global economy. Cooperation between those companies will be very beneficial, not only for the economies of Seoul and Tokyo, but also for the global economy. Another businessman from Japan said he has been attending this conference for 30 years. I think businessmen in both countries are responsible for restoring Korea-Japan ties through improving business relations. On Wednesday, the conference is slated to conclude with the release of a formal joint statement and a press conference where representatives from both countries will exchange their views on pending bilateral issues. 
Experts say this annual gathering of business leaders could take on greater significance as it can serve as a catalyst to ease bilateral tensions. Om ji Arirang News. South Korean airports, meanwhile, have seen a fall in the number of people traveling to and from Japan. According to the Korea Airports Corporation, seven local airports saw a 34 percent decline in passengers on Japan flights in the last week of August compared to the first week of July. There were only 100,000 in the last week of August. Flights were cut, too, by 19 percent. The main reason was a boycott by Koreans to protest Japan's trade restrictions, which started in July. Finance Minister Hong nam says South Korea and Russia are working to sign a free trade agreement in services and investment by next year. On a visit to Moscow Tuesday, local time, Minister Hong said a deal will be signed by 2020 and that an FTA in services and investment will not only help lower tariffs, but also speed up customs procedures. Seoul and Moscow started talks on a services and investment deal last June. The two sides' bilateral trade last year amounted to around 25 billion U.S. dollars. It's time now for an in-depth look at the global markets this afternoon. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Dr. Yang jun Suk, Professor of Economics at the Catholic University of Korea. Dr. Yang, thank you for coming on today. Happy to be here. Well, let's start in the U.S., where the Democrats think they might have an edge now on the idea of impeaching President Trump. Wall Street was down Tuesday. Is that why? Well, uh, it was part of the reason, uh, but... Uh, very few people expect this to uh, the impeachment proceedings to have a, a longer effect on the stock market, and that's because, well, uh, there's I think we could uh, have four reasons. First is that the Trump administration has always been somewhat unstable, uh, so there has been always at least some serious controversies in the administration, and this may be just one of those many. And then second reason is that, uh, well. Uh, uh, President Trump had a serious problem with Russia before, and there was the uh, big concern about how the Mueller report may start the uh, impeachment proceedings. That didn't happen. And then if we look at uh, U.S. president impeachments in the 20th century, uh, there's only two examples, President Nixon and President Clinton. Now, President Nixon, uh, there were some serious uh, economic effects. Uh, during the time of the impeachment proceedings, but these, this was also the time when U.S. went off the Bretton Woods standard and there was the second oil shock. So uh, the uh, adverse effect on the economy can be explained with that. Uh, with impeachment of President Clinton, nothing really much happened in the stock market. And even if the case is brought uh, by the House of Representatives, uh, the fourth reason is that the impeachment will be decided by the Senate, which is held mostly by uh, President Trump's allies in the Republican Party. So in the end, it's probably not going to do anything really significant. It might have a lot of symbolic meanings, uh, but it probably won't have anything concrete uh, to do with the economy or the stock market. So I think that's why uh, while we'll see some negative effects and we'll see some roller coaster rides from here on, it probably won't have any serious permanent repercussions. Got it. Well, another story. Uh, we've got cryptocurrencies. They've seen a huge recovery since around the middle of this year, but overnight there was a sharp drop in the price of Bitcoin. Uh, it's a really volatile area, but where do you see crypto going? Okay, well, this is what happens when you don't have a central bank to try to uh, maintain a value of a currency. Uh, if there's some uh, problems that may come up and there's some changes in value. There's nothing really restraining it from going too high or going too low. So cryptocurrencies are always going to be volatile unless they have something equivalent to a central bank. Now, what particular set, uh, event set this off? No one really knows, but one possibility is that on the 24th of September U.S. time, uh, the future market for Bitcoin was supposed to have started. And while uh, and the market did start, but the effect of the uh, future market was not as great as what a lot of people hoped it would be. Uh, so the uh, uh, Bitcoin did not gain as much as those investors hoped, and I think that caused some decrease in the Bitcoin prices 
uh, overnight, and that was uh, aggravated uh, by, as I said, having no central uh, bank. Yeah, it's a unique situation for sure, uh, and the future is so uncertain. But uh, looking at Korea, the economy here, we've had very low consumer inflation for a while. It seems like that might continue now that we see producer prices were down again in August compared to a year ago. Why are producer prices falling, and what's your outlook? Okay, well, uh, the uh, core inflation, the core uh, consumer price index inflation and core producer price uh, in a price index had been very weak for a long time. Uh, if you look at month to month changes, about four to five months of that negative change uh, and five or six months of that positive change. Uh, so it was weak all along, all along. But last year, what happened in August was that the price of agricultural goods, especially fresh food, went up very high uh, because uh, the uh, very hot summer that we had last year. This year, the agricultural prices did not go up as much, so it could not counteract against a lot of the negative effects that we had throughout the year. Uh, so basically, uh, the food prices in August, agricultural prices in August, made a difference between having a positive 12-month uh, price change and negative 12-month price change. So. Uh, should we be worried about deflation? Not yet. Uh, if you look at month-to-month -month changes, even in the uh, producer's price index, it actually went bu uh, up by 0.02%. Uh, but should we be worried about long-term weak uh, demand and weak inflation? Yes, I think that we should be uh, concerned about that, and we, we should be using expansionary fiscal and monetary policies to try to get us out of it. Got it, Dr. Young. All right, thanks so much uh, for coming on today and sharing your insights. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, it's common knowledge that too much sodium isn't good for you. Data show China has the highest sodium intake in the world, but here in South Korea, average salt consumption has been falling. It's still, though, above the recommended levels. Kim mo gyun has this report. People in China have the highest salt intake in the world. According to new research led by Queen Mary University of London, Chinese adults over the past four decades have consumed an average of 10.9 grams a day, more than double the World Health Organization's recommended limit of 5 grams. This is because Chinese foods, especially those dishes from Sichuan province, are known for their spicy and strong flavors, which come from salty seasonings and spices. Other countries with similar intakes include Portugal, Montenegro and Benin. As for South Korea, Daily sodium intake has been decreasing over the past decade, but the most recent figure, which is from 2017, showed that the average intake per person was still 3,478 milligrams per day, which is similar to the U.S. and some European countries. That figure is far above the WHO's recommended level of 2,000 milligrams per day. Traditionally, a complete Korean table includes kimchi and stews, which both contain large amounts of salt. And according to research done by Gyeongbuk National University, one of the most famous Korean dishes, bibimbap, which is a bowl that contains a mixture of rice, seasonal vegetables and hot chili paste, had the highest sodium content of any Korean dish, with around 1,050 milligrams of sodium per serving. Fermented bean paste stew and soft tofu stew also contained a lot of salt. These figures are concerning, as large amounts of sodium can raise blood pressure, which leads to an increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. In order to prevent our bodies from sodium-related health problems, experts advise we cut down on meat and eat more fruits and vegetables, as these contain lots of potassium, which helps remove sodium from our bodies. Kim mo Arirang News. And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.
2009.